Richard asked me to do something in December around the, the theme of Advent or Christmas. And, um, you know, R Richard and I are both in a tradition um, where we make a distinction between uh, the season of Advent and the season of Christmas. Uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not really a liturgical fundamentalist on these things. It, you know, I, I, I don't think everyone has to do this, but in our world at least, from some sense of the ordering of time and the way in which the church orders its own understanding of time, last Sunday, the first Sunday of, of, of uh, Advent, is the, is the beginning of the new year. You know, so I guess from a Christian perspective, we say, Happy New, <laughs> Happy new Year to you, to you today. Um, so we're in that season, and uh, the way in which our tradition works, the last, the last Sunday of the church calendrical year is Christ the King Sunday. Not a bad way to end the year. Um, a, recogni a recognition of who is Lord, especially as you move into Advent. And then, and then the first Sunday of Advent and the season of Advent leading up to Christmas Day itself is understood as a season of repentance and contrition and renewal. Um, and, in fact, years ago when my wife and I were in, uh, in Scotland together, we heard a minister say something to the effect of on the first Sunday of Advent, so, so what are you giving up this year for Advent? And he was being a bit provocative, but of course the idea is that Advent, from a seasonal perspective, mimics and mirrors something like Lent that comes later as we move toward Easter. So th this is um, a season of, of reflection and renewal. Now, admittedly, ev everything within our cultural realities around us will lean, will lean heavily against this season being one of reflection and renewal. No, there's just, there's just a lot going on. Um, we, we, fu we fulfilled a Genelette dream uh, last night in our family. I've talked to, about this with my wife for a decade about having a little St. Nicholas Day. Today is technically uh, St. Nicholas Day, uh, in the, again, in the history of the church, December the 6th that celebrates uh, this bishop from, early, early church bishop named uh, Nicholas, who is from um, uh, Asia Minor. And of course, that's the famous story about the, 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 the father that didn't have enough money to marry off his daughters. And, and so St. Nicholas well, uh, sneaks into their house at night and leaves a bag of coins there for them that they find in the morning, and then the father can... So we had all these kids over last night to our house from our church to do a little St. Nicholas party. Uh, and they put their shoes on the front porch. They leave your shoes here, and and uh, we we made cookies, and then read a Saint Nicholas story. And I had my teenage boys go out while we were reading the story and stick um, gold coins in their shoes while we were while we were. Uh, I mean, it, my, my old my my oldest my, my middle son or something. He's like, you were having a good time tonight, weren't you, Dad? I was like, this was absolutely fantastic. I mean, that, so I mean, this, this is a season that kind of intermingles for us wonder and magic and joy, but, but also a sense of longing and hope and a recognition that our, world, our world's not working like it's supposed to work. It's, it's off kilter. Um, sin is still operating within the darkness of the world, and we know that with human conflict and global conflict that goes on around the world. And we know it within the wrestling matches that take place in our own hearts. We, we recognize that darkness has not been completely dispelled yet. And, and so that's what this season of Advent is. We might not feel that way in terms of the season in our culture, but, but at least in the reality um, of the universe and the reality of the world, we, we know that we're caught in the tension and the overlap of the first Advent when our Lord appeared and the second Advent when our Lord will return again to consummate and make everything new. So he's coming to the world and, and yet he's not, he's not coming, he's not consummated, he's not brought his kingdom into its, its, its fulfillment in this world. And um, So all to say, blessed Advent to you as you think through this season and pray through this season and, and move toward the longing and the joy that the Christmas morning brings us. This is just a delightful time of the year. Um, I'll also say too, I, I just forget uh, and I'm off script here, gentlemen, sorry about that, but um, I, f I forget the changing of the leaves that happen in, in, um, in Birmingham in, in a time that appears like the wrong, the wrong time of year. Um, 
You know, my wife and I went to Vermont in October to do, I guess what they call it is leaf peeping, right? We did, went and do, did some leaf peeping up there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're like me. I feel like the leaves right now in Birmingham with these hardwoods are so remarkable that they're kind of taking my breath away. You know, this morning, um, you know, I could see the sun coming up and just illuminating these, these maples that are around. And very, so all to say, we're, we're just seeing the wonder of creation around us even now and, and, uh, and all of this, I think, in some sense, g- g- tapping into these longings that we have um, for a world um, that's no longer marked by sin and darkness. Um, we're in the winter right now, feels that way this morning, and, and we're hoping for the spring. Um, and that's what the mystery of the incarnation is all about. The incarnation is that the Word of God, the eternal Son of God, God in His own being, rolling up His sleeves. That's kind of the language of Isaiah. Exposing His arm of salvation, rolling up His sleeves and entering into the muck and the mire and the mess of our world. I mean, just think about the very humble beginnings that Jesus makes entering into the world through a woman's birth canal and then into the, the modesty and, uh, of, of a stable with animals and straw and a manger and, and shepherds who are um, humble men, you know, coming to be the first ones to visit and to recognize um, who this king of the universe is that's coming to the world. I mean, that, that's, that's what this season is about. And I, I wanted to read to you this morning before we dive in. Um, I stumbled upon this book a couple of weeks ago when I was away at a conference by Charles Haddon Spurgeon uh, called Good Tidings of Great Joy, um, Christ's Incarnation as the Foundation of Christianity. It, it is a gem. I mean, you can find it on Amazon. Um, do, do you all know who Charles Spurgeon is? He was a great 19th century Victorian preacher in London. Um, the, rumor, the rumors are that Queen Victoria used to disguise herself and sneak in to hear the great preacher preach. I mean, there's something about these British monarchs like Victoria and Elizabeth. They were somewhat taken with these evangelical preachers. Uh, apparently Victoria liked Spurgeon. I think Queen Elizabeth had a little bit of a or a deep interest in Billy Graham. I mean, it's kind of remarkable. Um, Spurgeon's one of these sort of bigger-than-life Preachers. He was a heavy set man. He smoked cigars. You know, he just had a, matter of fact, the story is told that um, Spurgeon was walking the streets of London, saw a young, younger man, like maybe 13, 14, smoking a cigar on the streets. And Spurgeon stopped him and he said, Young man, can you smoke that cigar to the glory of God? And, and the boy looked a little forlorn and he said, no, no, sir, I can't. He said, Well, then give it to me because I can. Uh, you know, so he's just got just one of these sort of big personalities and great preacher. His three volumes on the Psalms called The Treasury of David, um, I think is something of a spiritual classic in the, in the Western, especially in the English-speaking uh, tradition. So I, I commend them to you. But can I do something to you this morning that I hate being done to me? I, mean, I just don't, I don't like this. But I'm, I'm going to read to you uh, for his, uh, part of his first entry of, of day number one on this. I just thought it was so good. And sits on top of our topic. He says, glory to God in the highest. So that he's quoting there the angels, you know, that, that uh, arrive in Luke 2. And then he says, the instructive lesson to be learned from this opening note of the angel's song is that salvation is God's highest glory. He is glorified in every dewdrop that twinkles in the morning sunshine. He is magnified in every wood flower that blossoms in the copse. He's glorified in every bird that warbles on the trees and in every lamb that skips in the meadows. Do not the fishes in the sea praise him? From the tiny minnow to the huge leviathan, think great white sharks there. Do not all creatures that swim in the waters laud and magnify his great name? Do not all created things extol Him? Is there anything beneath the sky that does not glorify God? Do not the stars exalt Him when they write His name in golden letters upon the heavens? Do not the lightnings adore Him when they flash in brightness and arrows of light piercing the midnight darkness? Do not the thunder peals extol Him when they roll like drums in the march of the God of the armies? 
Do not all things that he has made from the least unto the greatest exalt him? And now he's going to kick up the ante here. But sing, O universe, until you have exhausted yourself. Yet you cannot chant an anthem so sweet as the song of the Incarnation. Though creation may be a majestic organ of praise, it cannot reach the compass of the golden canticle, that is, the Incarnation. There is more melody in Jesus in the manger than in the whole sublime oratorio of the creation. There is more grandeur in the song that heralds the birth of the babe of Bethlehem than there is in worlds on worlds rolling in silent grandeur around the throne of the Most High. That's pretty good. Oh, I, as, as one of my uh, colleagues would say, oh, oh Spurgeon made the cut. Um, he just knows, he knows how to turn a phrase. That, I think he gets at the sense of wonder that we're dealing with in this particular season. Because in the glory of the incarnation, in the modesty and the humility of the manger, what we are observing there is God dealing a death blow to the pride of humanity. It's our pride that has set us up in a barrier between the living God. It's our pride, our own self-sufficiency, our own tendency within the very fabric of our human condition that we would take the fruit every time. We might get mad at old Adam and Eve, but we would take the fruit every time in order that we might be like God. Um, that's within our own fallenness as human beings. We, we would do that. And that act of taking the fruit is in itself an act of human pride that, that sets ourselves up over against the God of the universe and leaves us in a and what appears to be, from a human perspective, an irreparable relationship with the living God, a chasm between us and the living God that's infinite in its scope. We can't, we can't transverse it. We can't cross the bridge or the divide or the chasm on our own. So what does God do? God doesn't leave us in our own um, brokenness and in our lost state. He enters into the world in the humility of His Son, in the manger, as a baby, um, to deal a death blow to evil, sin, death, and our, and our own human pride. It's, it's just, uh, who, as my dad would often say, um, who would have written the script this way? Like, who, who would have thought about this plan, this redemptive plan, um, this mysterious, magical plan of God ent entering into the world in the, in, the, in the humility of a child that then grows up to become and is for us the Savior of the world. So, um, blessings to you as you enter this season. I, I wanted, if you're, all, if you're okay, and, and here you are, you can't go anywhere, I guess. Uh, but I wanted to look at Micah chapter 5 with you. Because this is, we're, we're going to, my, my new favorite uh, uh, tech, tech, technological term is toggling. I like that word. I'm, we're going to toggle, uh, I'm not sure I know what it means, but uh, we're, we're going to move between, is that what it's back and forth? We're going to move between Micah and John chapter, and the book of John, John 1. We're kind of going to go back and forth today a little bit. Um, but I wanted you to see Micah 5 too. If, if there are a couple of verses from the minor prophets that are known, and perhaps, uh, I, I, mean, I think I've even seen one of these verses on a bumper sticker in, in Birmingham, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, boy, we know that one. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. If there's another text that I think is probably pretty well known, it's Micah 5, 2. This is, this is an Advent text. My hunch is if you are in a liturgical, lectionary setting in your church, you're going to hear Micah 5 read to you at some time over the next four weeks whether that's in the lessons and carol service, whether that's in the reading of the morning, um, you're going to hear Micah 5 too. And I, want, and I wanted to read it to you because it's really, it's a remarkable text. I'll say, I just think it's absolutely remarkable. And this is what Micah the prophet says, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, again, here's this theme of humility. Here's this theme of smallness. Deuteronomy 17 tells us that the kings of Israel need to remember their modest state. The danger that comes with any king that ascends to a position of power is that power, um, unchecked, will corrupt um, those that hold the seat. Even 
Even sweet Bilbo Baggins, right? Uh, slides that ring, or, ring of power on and it can turn into a monster like that. So the ring of power affects us all. And in Deuteronomy, um, Moses tells the future kings of Israel, you might want to have somebody around to read the law to you regularly, to remind you of God's claims on you and who you are in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in light of His glory and His power and His electing grace. So here, here's this sort of claim of smallness and humility. Of course, we remember the manger. We remember Jesus riding in on the, on the back of a, of a donkey in the triumphal entry. Not a, not a great steed, not a war horse, but a humble donkey. So this theme of humility, of undoing the powers of this world that hold it in its corruption, that, that it's, it's dealt its blow by humble efforts here, the, 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 uh, the, the paradox of, of humility. So we'll come back to that. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Look at this, what he says in verse 4. He, this ruler, is going to stand and shepherd the flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord uh, his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he, verse 5, will be our peace. So this conception here of peace and stability and security, the kind of king that we've always been yearning for is being promised here in Micah chapter 5. And there's some... There's some features of Micah 5, 2 that are worth noting. If, if you see here at the beginning, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah. Now, I think two things are going on here. <clears throat> Number one, whenever you read about Bethlehem Ephratah, of course, that immediately sends us back to a Davidic context. We're talking here about King, something related to King David. David came from Bethlehem. Um, <clears throat> have any of you, have you been, some of you on Zoom may probably have, been to, to Bethlehem before? Um, Be Bethlehem's kind of the backwaters. Uh, it's, uh, on, on analogy for us, it's, um, you know, it's Jasper, uh, uh, may maybe Columbiana. And, and no, you know, I'm not speaking ill of those places, I'm just saying they're, 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 not, they're not the epicenters of religious and political power, that's what I'm saying. Jerusalem is the epicenter of religious power. We'll come back to that in a second. But when you see this kind of claim about Bethlehem Ephrathah, you've got this allusion to the Davidic promise that God made in 2 Samuel that it is David and David's progeny that are going to be those that sit on the throne of Israel. And you'll notice that in these genealogies that appear in Matthew and Luke, it's, it's very important to show that Jesus has some sort of claim all the way back to David, and of course, even back to Bethlehem. So think about the providence of God, even with the Caesar, the, the imperial power of Rome, organizing a census that providentially forces um, Joseph and Mary back to Bethlehem so that all this, this, these prophetic promises can be fulfilled. It's, it's kind of wild, right? So you've got this Davidic sense here that's going on. But number two... You also have a sense of newness or a refreshed beginning. Why? Well, this is Micah. He's an 8th century prophet. There have been king, many kings of Judah. In fact, Micah probably you know, serves in the time of, of Hezekiah and probably... Um, Jotham and Ahaz that came before Hezekiah. So you're, you're dealing here with the kings of Judah that have already been on the scene. And you would think that if the promise is being made about a new Davidic king, that the promise would be made toward Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem is now the cultural and the religious and the prophetic um, epicenter of, of Israel. That's, that's where... The powerhouse is. Micah is a prophet down in the lowland regions. Isaiah is a prophet in the epicenter of Jerusalem. I mean, this is, this is where the elites are, where the, where the intelligentsia are, where the political power is. So the fact that, that Micah says, we're going back to Bethlehem Ephrata, 
suggests this renew, renewal of, of the beginning. Um, and, and he's not alone on this. Jeremiah does something similar where he talks about um, someone coming as, a, as, as the offspring of Jesse. Um, there's, a, there's a suggestion here of newness. In other words, there's a link of continuity with this promised king because he's Davidic. But there's a discontinuity as well with this coming king because it's not all things as usual. One king begets the next king who begets the next king. There's, there's something about this uh, future coming king that breaks in on us in ways that are unexpected. I think that's the idea here. So that's a, you know, just the, the language of Bethlehem Ephrata is loaded, but Micah begins to, to uh, um, elevate and expand the language to describe this future coming um, king. Look what he says here in the, in the middle line. Out of you will come for me. Now, um, an English professor would look at that and say, uh, 10 points off, unclear antecedent, right? Like you don't, you don't just introduce a pronoun like me without some clarity about who the me is. But I think this is, again, lends itself to part of the mystery that's going on here. Who is the me? Well, the you is Bethlehem Ephrata. The me is the God of the universe, the Lord, the one who's elected and chosen Israel and, and, and made promises to David and David's line. So out of you, Bethlehem, will come from, for, for me a ruler. And then these last lines here, I don't know how to describe these last two lines of Micah 5.2 other than they require something like primordial smoke and haze. I mean, you're, you're pre- in other words, you're pressing through what you see here in, in uh, Micah 5.2 in Bethlehem and Ephrata, the manger scene that we see in Matthew and Luke. You're pressing through these into eternity itself. Like, you're moving through the ordinary moments of time into the very counsel and life of God himself. The language that's used here is really stunning. His origins, so he just said, from you, Bethlehem, will come for me a ruler. But now he's going to say, but his origins go deeper than Bethlehem Ephrata. His origins come from of old. His origins come, and I've got the NIV this morning, and I'm going I'm to give the NIV a, a C- minus here. Um, if you have, what, is the, what does the ESV say? From ancient days. Um, does, do any of your translations say the days of eternity? Um, that, I think the New American Standard says that. that. That's the idea that I think is going on here. From days of old, from, from ancient days, from eternal days. In Deuteronomy, these two terms that are used in these lines, the, the, the one that says from of old or from uh, times of eternity, days of eternity, are actually used to predicate the God of Israel. In other words, this is provocative, stunning language. Um, Not everyone obviously reads it this way, and I can understand why some don't read it this way. But it is at the very least highly suggestive here that this future coming king that's coming from Bethlehem has an origin that comes from God's own very being itself. That seems to be the idea that's going on here. Um, in fact, and I, I, could, I could lose you, I could, the Zoom people, don't, don't check out on me yet. Um, that first line that says, from of old, and I'm going to give you a little Greek here, it, the Greek translation of that says, from uh, from our case, or from uh, the beginning. When we toggle to John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word for beginning in John 1.1 1, 1 is our case. In the beginning uh, God, uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Um, I I could lose you here, but it is at least interesting that in the Hebrew text, um, Genesis 1-1 is marked like this. In the beginning, semicolon, 
God created the heavens and the earth. Another way, in other words, they put a little cesura, a little break right here. Another way of reading this is by the beginning one, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, are you, are you, have I lost you? I want you to look at one more text with me. Look at John 8, 25. This is wild. John 8, 25. Well, let's, let's back up to verse uh, 23. But he continued, this is Jesus. Uh, <laughs> I always laugh when I read this. Uh, Jesus did not tell the truth slant. I mean, he, he is going to come right at you with double guns loaded. I was... I always joke with my students at Beeson that if you want to ruin a dinner party, invite Jesus, because he's going to start asking really provocative questions, and he's going to force you to kind of come to terms with who you are. I mean, it's a very, he's very direct. He says here, uh, you are from below, I am from above. They're all, they, they're all befuddled. They do not know what in the world he's talking about. He says, you are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. I mean, that is, um, I would not call that a soft evangelism strategy. I mean, I would call that a, you know, the air, yeah, exactly. It's not not, not highly relational here, Jesus. We need to to send him to an evangelism seminar. Um, I mean, th- this, is, this is the plane plummeting from 30,000 feet, and you've got about three minutes till impact kind of evangelism. All right, so I mean, it, it, it's powerful. So they're obviously, you know, um, again, just befuddled and struck by what Jesus is saying. The next question that they ask, I love it, because it's like, this is the heart of the Christian faith. This is the kind of searching question that all Christians are asking and re-asking and re-answering again and again in our faith. Look at what they say. Who are you? <laughs> is that great? I mean, it's so simple, but who in the world are you? Who says stuff like this? Who invited you? Uh, who invited you? That's right. Um, uh, I'm not a huge C.S. Lewis person. I'm kind of getting into him a little bit more here in middle age. But, um, C.S. Lewis in his, uh, famously said that Jesus is, you remember this triad? Jesus is either a, a, a liar, a lunatic, or he is the Lord of the universe. Um, we might want to find some sort of soft middle ground that says, you know that Jesus was quite a, quite a wise man, quite a sage. He was special, um, cared for people, kind of like inspiring, like Spartacus, or wise, like Confucius. I mean, I mean, have at that if you want it. The things that Jesus says about himself are so stunning that I think Lewis is right. He's either lying He's either out of his mind with either megalomania or uh, some sort of mental health disorder. He's bipolar. Um, or it's true, and he's the Lord of the universe, God in human flesh. Like It seems like those, those are your legitimate three options. Because he just made claims here about being the Lord of the universe. And when he answers the question, and I'm sorry that I'm going to go, go a little Greek on you here, but when he answers the question, this is what it says, um, ju- and I've got the NIV, just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. This is what the Greek does. And I don't know if any translations that do this, but there's some great commentators in the history of the church who do this, St. Augustine being one of them. The Greek goes like this, Who are you, they said, the beginning? In other words, The beginning thing here that most translations slide toward the end are the first words out of Jesus' mouth, and they're not immediately clear what those words are doing grammatically. Given the context here, I I think I'd go to Vegas and put all of my chips on on this reading right here. When Jesus says the beginning, he's not making a temporal reference like most of our translations do, as I've been telling you from the beginning. He's giving himself a title. It's a name. 
You want to know who I am? The one that just told you I'm not from this world? The one that just told you I can forgive your sins? That you are from here, below, I'm from above? Who am I? I'm the beginning. I'm our case. Um, I'm, the, I'm the instrument by which time and space and creation have come to be. Um, so when you think about that kind of language that Jesus is using to describe himself, he is the God of the universe in human flesh. And that forces us back to John 1. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. So a distinction within the divine being. The Father and the Son in communication, the one with the other. But then it goes on to say, and the Word was God. So that to speak of the essence and the nature of what God's being is requires us to speak of the Word and the Father within the same breath. And we bring in the Spirit. That is God's own triune, essential being as Father, Son, and Spirit. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. There is not anything that has been made apart from the Word. He's the instrument of salvation. He is the beginning one. By the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is that which has brought all things into being. I mean, what you're seeing John tell us here at the beginning of John 1 is, whatever you can say about God um, can equally be said about the Word who's been manifest in Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter that made tables and chairs for you to sit around with your family. Um, one of the things that's striking about John John likes to swim in his own stream. Uh, he just does things a little bit differently than the other Gospels. I don't think he's offering you, by the way, an alternative Jesus. That's a certain reading strategy that's out there. I don't think that's what's going on. I think John assumes you know a Gospel like Mark already. So he's not trying to give you a, a different Jesus. He's providing for you another entry point to understand who this Jesus of Nazareth is. And there are some things in John's Gospel that are conspicuously absent. No baptism scene. No Last Supper scene. Right? But those scenes appear in subtle and provocative, almost like thickly textured painting kind of ways. John chapter 3, unless you're born of the, wa of the, of the Spirit and of water, Nicodemus, you can have no part of me. Well, what? I mean, again, the traditions read that as a kind of baptismal scene. John chapter 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. Well, most of this is a controversial text, but most of the tradition have seen that as a kind of Eucharistic scene. You know what else is markedly absent? No, no infancy narratives. No Christmas scene in John's Gospel. Where's the manger and the, and the magi and the shepherds and the angels? Where, where's all that stuff? You don't get it. John chapter 1 is the infancy narrative of John's Gospel. And it pushes you from the manger into the very eternal being of God. That's his eternal generation, is what, how uh, theologians would describe it. And the shocker of John 1 is John chapter 1, verse 14. This is, this is the text that I think so much of our Christian faith hangs on this text right here. And the Word uh, became flesh <laughs> and dwelt among us. The Word, who is the very being of God Himself, at one with the Father, the instrument of creation, the beginning one, has taken on human flesh and He has tabernacled among us. He's the temple of God's presence in our midst. He's the, he's the light of God's countenance shining on us. He is the light that has come into the world to expel the darkness. Let me, I'll leave you with that. That's what the season celebrates. It's what we enter into with our, uh, with our Christian hope. Maybe you've been in those scenes or settings here in Alabama, in those deep caverns that we have around here, uh, where they go, you go deep into the heart of the earth, and they say, you will now experience total darkness. <laughs> Light goes off. You're like, ah, can't see your hand in front of your face. Right? You know what's amazing about darkness? Darkness is almost not a thing. Darkness is merely the absence of light itself. You, we all know that if you're in that setting in the cave and you pull a box of matches out of your pocket, a simple match from your pocket struck in that cave will win. It will dispel the darkness that's proximate to it. The light 
always wins. And the humility of the manger that manifests the eternal being of God and His intention to love and save His world and His people that have been lost because of sin, we see the light of God on display dispelling the darkness of the world. And that is our hope for the first advent, and that's our hope for the second advent as well. Lord Jesus, bless these men. Strengthen them and encourage them, I pray, in your grace and the hope of the gospel. You, Jesus, are the word that's taken flesh and dwelled among us, bringing the presence of God into our midst to dispel the darkness. And Lord, we know that you've come into the world, and we say equally, even now, O oh Lord Jesus, return, come, and consummate your kingdom here in this world so that the darkness will be permanently expelled because of the light and the glory of your own countenance and radiance revealed in the manger, revealed in the cross, revealed in the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.